Shout out to Mark and David for season two of Brandology. It's entertaining, funny, and full of cool stories. Play hilarious brand trivia and talk with famous guests like founders of iconic brands. Brandology is available everywhere now. So go check it out and see for yourself. Welcome everyone to season two of the Brandology podcast series. This season we're going to reignite our brand stories, our case studies, and we're going to include feature exclusive interviews. We're going to talk about epic product successes, huge epic product fails, and the rise and fall series of some of the most iconic brands. So come listen and please leave us a review. For this next segment, there have been literally hundreds of articles, a best-selling book by Wall Street Journal author John Carreyrou, and a movie, a documentary called The Inventor. This story is one of the most legendary entrepreneurial healthcare technology stories in modern times. This is the rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes and the brand Theranos. Today, the Theranos founder, Elizabeth Holmes, faces federal fraud charges and is awaiting trial in the spring summer of 2021. Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos are one of the most infamous cases of a fall from grace from the unicorn startup world of Silicon Valley. They were considered a tech unicorn by the media and by industry watchers, propelling the founder into becoming the youngest billionaire on the cover of Forbes magazine set to disrupt the entire U.S. healthcare industry. This only resulted in just a few short years later in federal indictment and bankruptcy. So Elizabeth Holmes, let's start from the beginning. She dropped out of Stanford at the young age of 19 to found Theranos, which purported to revolutionize the way blood tests were done. One simple drop of blood pricked from a finger could diagnose a myriad of diseases and conditions, or so she claimed. Now, to judge Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos now is really missing the point. This is a remarkable story of a unicorn healthcare tech company. It's a cautionary tale for all of us about overselling or overpromising something when the technology isn't quite ready. It's a cautionary tale of being very wary of the phrase, fake it till you make it. The more we learn and research the Theranos timeline and the actions of those involved, One underlying theme emerged to us. So many brilliant, experienced people were fooled. Why? Because they wanted to believe. We don't feel Elizabeth Holmes even intended to defraud anyone at the beginning at all. I mean, her initial motives and her initial goals were good. She was driven by the death of a close uncle She wanted to cure the delays and death caused in the lab industry, run by mostly two main companies with over 80% market share, Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp of America. Their lab results and their testing for blood tests require you to draw vials and vials of blood from your arm through a venous puncture, right? A big thick needle that goes into your arm. It's painful, it's uncomfortable, it's difficult for a lot of people. It's costly, it takes too long and it's inefficient. So the issue that drove her was fear of needles and the desire to kind of speed up the timeline for diagnosis and to democratize everything to to give us all more control over our own healthcare and treatment. Her vision was very similar to like Jobs, like Steve Jobs, which was one of her idols, to democratize healthcare so that we all have a lab box in our own homes one day just like Jobs' vision of having us all have a personal computer, which obviously came true. Thus was born Theranos. The word comes from therapy and diagnosis, Theranos. Let's rewind a bit to 2014. The blood testing startup Theranos and its founder, Elizabeth Holmes, were on top of the world. Back then, Theranos was a revolutionary idea thought up by this woman, hailed as a genius who styled herself as a female Steve Jobs. Holmes was the world's youngest female self-made billionaire, billionaire with a b and theranos was one of silicon valley's unicorn startups valued at an estimated nine billion dollars of which she owned 50 percent. so this is how elizabeth holmes went from a precocious child to an ambitious stanford dropout to an embattled startup founder now charged with 
federal fraud charges. She was born February 3rd, 1984 in Washington, D.C. Her mom, Noel, was a congressional committee staffer and her dad, Christian Holmes, worked for Enron before moving to government agencies like USAID. She and her family, when they were young, moved away from Washington, D.C. to Houston. When she was seven, she tried to invent her own time machine, filling up an entire notebook with detailed engineering drawings. A couple years later, she told relatives at a uh, family gathering uh, when asked what she wanted to be. She said, I want to be a billionaire at the age of nine. That was her answer. Her relatives described her as saying it with the utmost seriousness and determination. She had an intense competitive streak from a young age. She often played Monopoly with her younger brother and cousin, and she would insist on playing until the very end, collecting houses and hotels until she won. If she was losing, she would often storm off. More than once, she ran directly through a screen on the door in a tantrum. Then in high school, Holmes developed her work ethic, often staying up till dawn just to study. She quickly became a straight-A student and even started her own business in high school. She sold C++ compilers, which is a type of software that translates computer code to Chinese schools. She started taking Mandarin classes and partway through high school talked her way into being accepted by Stanford University's summer program, which culminated in a trip to Beijing. Inspired by her great-grandfather Christian Holmes, who was a surgeon, Holmes decided she wanted to go into medicine, but she discovered early that she was terrified of needles. Later, she said this is one of the things that influenced her, along with her uncle's death, to start Theranos. A couple years later, Holmes started at Stanford to study chemical engineering. When she was a freshman, she became a president's scholar, an honor which came with a $3,000 stipend to go toward a research project. She spent the summer after her freshman year interning at the Genome Institute in Singapore. She got the job partly because she learned how to speak Mandarin. As a sophomore, she went to one of her professors. And this isn't just any professor. This was Channing Robertson, the head of the science department at Stanford University. And she said, let's start a company. And with his blessing, she founded Real Time Cures, which later changed the name to Theranos. Uh, ironically, thanks to a typo, early employees of that company actually got paychecks that actually said real time curses. But what was interesting is the head, Channing Robertson, who actually quit his job there to join the board and work for her. That's how much belief these people had in her. She soon filed a patent for a medical device that would analyte monitoring and drug delivery, a wearable device that would administer medication, monitor patients' blood, and adjust the dosages as needed. By the next semester, she had completely dropped out of Stanford. She wasn't attending school and she was working full-time for her company. And it started all in the basement of a college house there at Stanford University. Theranos' business model was based around the idea that it could run blood tests using proprietary technology that required only a fingerprint and a small amount of blood. Holmes said the test would be able to detect medical conditions like cancer and high cholesterol immediately and begin rendering therapy. And if they can create this model and place it in everyone's home, the entire democratization of healthcare would be be disruptive. It would change the world as we know it. Holmes' attitude towards secrecy and running a company was borrowed from a Silicon Valley hero of hers, former Apple CEO Steve Jobs. Holmes started dressing in black turtlenecks like Jobs, decorated her office with his favorite furniture, and like Steve Jobs, never took vacations. Even Holmes' uncharacteristically deep voice, which if you've seen any interviews with her, um, is kind of remarkable. Um, it might have been part of a carefully crafted image intended to help her fit in in the very male dominated business world of Silicon Valley. Uh, there's a podcast called The Dropout, where former Theranos employees uh, talk about her and say that, you know, sometimes she would fall out of character, especially after she'd be out drinking, and she would speak with a normal uh, female higher voice. But most of the time she spoke with a with a lower voice. Um, especially in, in interviews. 
She was known to be a demanding boss, wanting her employees to work as hard as she did. She had her assistants tracked when employees would arrive and leave each day to encourage people to work longer hours. She started to have dinner catered to the office every night at 8 p.m. She would often work until midnight or 11 p.m. and get in the office by 7 a.m. Shortly after she dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 and started this company, she began dating Theranos president and COO, Sonny Balwani. He was 20, 25 years her senior. Uh, the two met during Holmes's third year at Sam Stanford's summer Mandarin program, the summer before she went to college. She was bullied by some of the other students and Balwani kind of came to her aid. Um, Balwani became, Sonny Balwani, who's also one of the people indicted uh, in this federal uh, charge, uh, which is facing a trial in the spring, summer of 2021, became Elizabeth Holmes' number two right-hand person at Theranos, despite having very little experience. He was said to be a bully and he often tracked his employees' whereabouts. He would monitor everyone's emails, even if he wasn't on the email thread and would monitor all of their behavior. Holmes and Balwani eventually broke up in the summer of 2016 when Holmes pushed him out of the company. And we'll get to that in just a bit. But circling back to 2008, Theranos board um, started to have questions and started to make a move to remove Holmes as CEO in favor of someone a little bit more experienced. After all, she was just a girl in her 20s. But over the course of a two hour meeting, she sat down with this very impactful board that she had created. We're going to describe who she had on her board in just a second. And she convinced every single one of them to let her stay in charge of that company. But she did a lot of things. The culture was bad. The, um, the, the focus on secrecy and um, lack of uh, uh, transparency was obvious. I mean, even in 2011, she hired her younger brother, Christian, to work at Theranos, even though he didn't have any medical or science background. He spent his early days at Theranos reading about sports online and recruiting his Duke University fraternity brothers to join the company. People dubbed Holmes and his crew the frat pack or Thera Bros. As Theranos started to rake in millions in funding, Holmes became the subject of media attention and a lot of acclaim in the tech world. She graced the covers of Fortune and Forbes magazine. She gave a tech talk, which if you haven't seen, you should check it out on YouTube. And she spoke on panels with Bill Clinton and Alibaba's Jack May. At one point, Holmes was the world's youngest self-made female billionaire with a net worth around $4.5 billion. The company was valued at $9 billion. She owned half. And they had raised around $400 million in capital from major venture capitalists and investors. She started raising money for Theranos from prominent investors like Oracle founder Larry Ellison, Tim Draper, the father of a childhood friend and the founder of prominent VC firm Draper Fisher Jerviston. Um, she wound up raising even more than $700 million. What's interesting about this, it's not the amount of money because we hear about that a lot over in Silicon Valley. But what was interesting is she took investors' money on the condition that she wouldn't have to reveal how the technology worked. Think about that. Who does that? Who gives hundreds of millions of dollars on the story? not on the data. Plus she would keep, whenever she would take their money and, and receive their money in the investment, she would make it clear that she alone would have final say over everything having to do with the company. And yet the money came. That obsession with secrecy extended to every aspect at Theranos. For the first decade, Holmes spent building her company, Thera Theranos, operated in stealth mode. She even took three former Theranos employees to court, claiming they had misused Theranos' trade secrets. And now let's get to the board. Who were the, who was this board that, this illustrious board that, that got her all of this power and, and um, accolades? Well, she had names on there like General Mad Dog Mattis, Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State George Schultz, Larry Ellison, the head of the science department of Stanford, uh, Channing Robertson, even had quit his job to work for her. The, it was a laundry list of who's who. What was interesting is not any of them were physicians. 
They weren't science or medical people, but they were very politically collect connected and they were very um, tech savvy. So this focus and this obsession with security at Theranos was extreme. She had bulletproof glass. She had 20 bodyguards. People were followed to the bathrooms. All emails were monitored by the leadership team. It was a poisonous culture. She asked anyone who visited the company's headquarters to sign non-disclosure agreements before being allowed to even enter the building. And they had security guards escort visitors everywhere. So Theranos, as it began to grow, she and Sonny Balwani would go to the Silicon Valley um, airport and they would fly out in their private jets and they would go and they would do pitches. They would pitch for contracts and they got good at it. Again, data doesn't sit in the mind like stories do, right? Emotional stories speak to the part of the mind, kind of like what Simon Sinek talks about why, right? It talks to the part of the brain that modifies behavior. It gets people emotionally connected, right? And people didn't mind that they didn't have the data. Everyone wanted to believe that this would work. So Theranos quickly began securing outside partnerships. Capital Blue Cross and Cleveland Clinic signed on to offer Theranos tests to their patients. And then the big kahuna happened, Walgreens. Walgreens made a deal to open Theranos testing centers in their stores. Theranos also formed a secret partnership with Safeway worth $350 million. Now the goal with Walgreens was, because Walgreens was located about five miles or so from nearly every US home. And they wanted a, their ultimate goal was to put a Theranos box in the Theranos testing um, box, which is, you know, the size of like a air fryer or a big toaster um, in everyone's homes eventually. That's, that was the goal. And so how are they going to do it? They're going to go through a re retailer that has credibility that is located near those homes as step one. So they started it with um, Walgreens uh, in a select group of stores in Arizona. And then their goal was to push it out in select markets after that. But that's when everything changed. When the Walgreens rollout began to happen, those deadlines became real. And then basically the proverbial shit at the fan, right? They had to have the technology catch up with the promises that were sold. And the bottom line is it didn't. In fact, they would resort oftentimes back to drawing vials of blood from veins and shipping them out to third party lab companies. The Edison devices, which were designed and, and, and Sonny and Elizabeth made the engineers keep them so small that it was designed to do so many of these different lab tests and movements all within the small box that things would break. It was, it was, it was a cluster. It, it just, the results were inconclusive. The results were inaccurate. Things would overheat, things wouldn't work. And then they would do almost like a smoke and mirrors and then just go and get it, uh, the lab results done through independent, you know, third-party lab companies. So their, ev their Edison device, that's what they called it because they, they kept saying, we have to make 10,000 of them and they keep breaking, but we're going to, you know, the 10,000 first one is going to be the one that's going to work perfectly and it's going to change the world. That's why, you know, her idol was Thomas Edison and Steve Jobs. So this Edison device, this like big toaster thing, um, was to do approximately 200 tests from just a small drop of blood. Now, understanding that process, that blood needed to be diluted. And then even by diluting it more and more and more, the test results wound up being inconsistent and, and inaccurate. So what was the result of all this? That's when it all changed. The result was a PR nightmare and something that led to investigations and the ultimate demise. People got the wrong results back, there were delays, and it was just a cluster. The tarnish had set and the house of cards began to fall. And here's be, it's perhaps the tip of the iceberg in the fall of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. When the Edison tech was brought into question, this is how she described how it worked. Because she was brought on 
television shows and mad money and all of these financial shows because they're, they're like hey what's going on you, you know you're getting all this bad press what's happening and she and, and, and they all want to know like how does this thing really work here was her scientific explanation of how this works and i quote a chemistry is performed so that a chemical reaction occurs it generates a signal from the chemical reaction with the sample which it translated into a result which is then reviewed by certified lab technicians. Think about that. What the heck does that even mean? It's not scientific, it's not data-driven, it's not real. We know what she meant, we know what she wanted it to do, but that was about as clear and scientific as it got. So around this time, questions started being raised about the technology. Ian Gibbons, chief scientist at Theranos, and one of the company's first hires warned Holmes and Balwani that the tests weren't ready for the public to take and that there were inaccuracies in the technology. Outside scientists began voicing their concerns about Theranos too. The demise and the pressure that the internal Theranos people were under was so great that one of the head um, uh, scientists there uh, even committed suicide uh, long before a uh, or j the night before a uh, deposition was having to be given. By August 2015, the FBA, the FDA began investigating Theranos. Regulators from the government body that oversee laboratories found major inaccuracies, quote unquote, in the testing Theranos was doing on patients. See, part of the difference between what Thomas Edison was doing is he was going to the media and he was saying, I've created the light bulb, right? And he did this over and over, even though the light bulb filament had not been perfected yet, right? But by the time his funding was running out and his reputation was being thrashed, the technology caught up and the filament worked. And then he was lauded as a hero from then on. Here, the technology didn't catch up in time. And here, it's not just a light in a room or for show. This is testing done on patients. People were relying on these tests for their medical care. And it's a very regulated industry. That's one of the biggest differences. So 2014, 2015 is when it all starts to spiral. By October 2015, Wall Street Journal reporter John Carreyrou publishes his investigation into Theranos' struggle with its technology. Carreyrou's reporting is a landmark report and just sets off an explosion in this industry. His reporting sparked the beginning of the company's downward spiral. Carreyrou found that Theranos' blood testing machine, named the Edison, could not give accurate results. So Theranos was running its samples through the same machines used by traditional blood testing companies. Holmes then appeared on CNBC's Mad Money shortly after the Wall Street Journal um, published its story to defend herself in Theranos. And she's quoted as saying, this is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. By 2016, the following year, the FDA, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Security Exchange Committee were all looking into Theranos in formal investigations. By July 2016, criminal charges set in. Holmes was banned from the lab testing industry for two years. By October, Theranos had shut down its lab operations and wellness centers. In March 2018, Theranos, the company, Holmes individually and Sonny Balwani individually were charged with massive fraud by the Security Exchange Committee, Commission, the SEC. Holmes agreed to give up financial and voting control over the company, pay a $500,000 fine, and return 18.9 million shares of Theranos stock. She also is not allowed to be the director or officer of a publicly traded company for 10 years. Now, despite the charges, Holmes was allowed to stay on as CEO of Theranos since it's a private company. The company had been hanging on by a thread and Holmes wrote to investigators, or to investors rather, asking for more money in order to save Theranos. In light of where we are, this is no easy ask, she wrote. 
Now, today, Holmes and Balwani are now awaiting federal trial, although their cases have since been separated. If convicted, Holmes and Balwani could each pay, face up to 20 years in prison and more than a $2.7 million fine, the U.S. government has said. And besides the criminal case, Holmes is also involved in a number of civil lawsuits, including one in Arizona brought on by former Theranos patients over inaccurate blood tests. Uh, lawyers representing her in the Arizona case said in late 2019 they hadn't been paid over a year and they got asked to be removed from the legal team. Um, so the end of Theranos comes in June 2018, just a couple years ago. She, you know, Theranos announced that Holmes was stepping down as CEO in June. On the same day, the Department of Justice announced that a federal grand jury had charged Holmes, along with Balwani, with nine counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Those have since been upgraded and there's many more charges. Theranos sent an email to shareholders uh, in September of 18, just a few months later, announcing that the company was shutting down. Theranos reportedly said it planned to spend the next few months repaying creditors with its remaining resources. So where are we at today? Well, Holmes today, around the time Theranos' time was coming to an end, she made her first public appearance alongside William Billy Evans, a 27-year-old heir to a hospitality property, property management company in California. The two reportedly first met in 2017 and were seen together in 2018 at Burning Man, the art festival in the Nevada desert. Holmes is said to wear Evans' MIT signet ring on a chain around her neck and the couple reportedly post photos professing their love for each other on a private Instagram account. Um, Evan's parents are reportedly flabbergasted at their son's decision to marry Elizabeth Holmes. So while it's unclear where they currently reside, but they previously were living in a $5,000 a month luxury apartment in San Francisco up until April 2019, the apartment was located just a few blocks from one of the city's top tourist attractions. Famous part of the area, uh, it's a, a crooked block of uh, Lombard Street. It was later reported that Holmes and Evans got engaged in early 2019 and then married in June in a secretive wedding ceremony. Uh, former Theranos employees were reportedly not invited to the wedding, according to Vanity Fair. So as you look back at this fall of this unicorn and this just meteoric rise, we're left really with only questions. And the truth is yours to determine. One question was, did she oversell it? Did the tech just not catch up in time? Right? Did she and her leadership team simply become too insulated or out of touch to ignore the data? Is this something like Thomas Edison, who had sold the media on mastering the light bulb filament, but hadn't? You know, and then right as funding was running out and his reputation, the bulb was fixed. The tech caught up in time for him, but not for her. It's that Edison fake it until you make it so long as you don't defraud or risk the lives of people. I mean, as her idol, Steve Jobs and Tom Edison, Thomas Edison, um, they kept making errors and sold a vision until the technology would catch up before the time and funding ran out. Um, I mean, did she fail to, to stay realistic, right? Or did she just get caught up believing her own BS, right? Did the vast amount of money that they get just make them too insulated, you know? She used her story, right? Um, they did not, when, when they would get investor money, which you guys got to understand is they would never provide audited financial statements and no technical verifications were ever given. People would give them hundreds of millions of dollars without any data, without any audited financial statements. Try getting a mortgage for a $300,000 house these days. And it's like giving blood. And these people were giving hundreds of millions of dollars without any audited financial statements or any technical verifications. You know, the bottom line is data doesn't sit in the minds of people like stories do. Emotional stories, right, speak to the part of the mind and it, 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 it creates a vision and a belief and a, and, a, and, a, and a faith in someone. So now it rests, you know, with the government and, um, we just hope that that visionaries aren't hampered uh, by the by the inability to have that dream and wait for the technology to catch up. But in the same sense, they have to do it without risking the lives of people and without defrauding. 
We welcome you guys to check out the uh, key resources we found. There's a great book called Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in Silicon Valley. Um, there's uh, uh, the movie called The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, which is based on it. Um, and uh, there's uh, a podcast called The Dropout. Uh, please check it out. And we hope you enjoyed uh, the rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. Thanks for listening. Mark and I want to take a moment and thank everyone that listens and subscribes to our podcast. It means a lot. We're truly trying to make this one that we ourselves would find interesting and find entertaining. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas for subjects, great brands that have risen and fallen, great case studies, or fantastic guests that you'd like to see, please reach out to us. Brandology Podcast Staff at gmail.com. That's Brandology Podcast Staff at gmail.com. Hey, David, that was another great episode. We tend to post one or two a week. Uh, unfortunately, don't really have a way of wrapping this up. No, uh, no, we really don't have anything formal or fancy or technological. Um, thank you for listening. Please follow and subscribe, turn notifications on so that when we post the next episode, you will be notified of the new content. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate it. Everyone, thanks for listening. 